I'm a homemaker. Since I was a young child, I have been mediocre in both academics and athletics, earning acceptable grades throughout my 40s. I attended a typical college and obtained employment in an office. My spouse and I met in our mid-twenties through a mutual friend. Together, we have a son and make up a family of three. I believe that up until now, I have had a fairly normal life, despite my human fantasies about the glamorous world of celebrities and the wealthy. I felt content with my mundane existence and joyful. Naturally, my feelings weren't always that way. It is quite hard to perceive happiness when you are in the middle of it. Being able to go about your daily life as usual is actually not normal. I was unaware of my level of contentment until it vanished. It was after midnight, yet I told Nathan, who was watching TV in the living room, that it was time for him to go to bed. Good luck with your evening. Why? I've only recently begun to watch this show. Only a tiny bit more. Nathan would not leave the room at all after that. You won't get any taller if you stay up till this late. I had an idea to trick my son, who was self-conscious about his little stature, into going to bed. However, it didn't seem to be very effective, and he disregarded me. Prior to entering primary school, he was a more well-behaved child. However, this is who he has always been since junior high. He paid me no attention at all. After this program, you're probably heading to bed, am I right? Then my spouse, who was watching TV with Nathan, took Nathan's side. Yes, of course I will. Nathan acted compliant when my husband requested him to. In this case, I was always the evil guy. However, it was all right. I liked spending time with my family in this way, despite my small objections. You Nathan reluctantly walked to his room as the TV program he was watching concluded. In his place, I took a seat on the couch. I have heard that Nathan started to play a regular role on the team. My spouse had a conversation with me. What? Really, that's not what he told me. I was aware that he joined the soccer club and began junior high school in the fall, but I was unaware that he had established himself as a regular player on the squad. Nathan is one of the two seventh graders who, from what I've heard, have become regular members. I must have told him that. By my side, my spouse was cracking jokes. Why didn't he tell me something so important? I was also irritated. He was with me more often than with my husband, who got home from work at about nine o'clock. I figured that since he was the same these days, it would be easier for him to hang out with my spouse. I was growing more and more alone as this started happening more frequently. I suppose this is a necessary aspect of maturing. I attempt to convince myself like that. He will undoubtedly tell you about it tomorrow, so don't worry. My spouse then fetched some food from the refrigerator and two beer cans. We would chat about Nathan and other things while eating something light. As a pair, we probably got along very well. We talked until we were pleased, and then we had our regular bedtime routine. The next day, our lives would take a significant turn that I could not have predicted. The following morning, I got up and, as usual, set my husband and Nathan off. I quickly swept the room and washed up the breakfast dishes. I discovered I was out of detergent just as I was ready to do the laundry. I had forgotten about it and it had run out. I figured since I was just going to the local shops, I didn't really need to put on makeup. I simply finished brushing my hair and grabbed my handbag to head out of the house. When I visited the closest pharmacy, I discovered Nathan's favorite ice cream was discounted. Along with that, I purchased some fresh cheese crackers for my husband and I to have with our supper tonight. And there was a loud rumbling sound while I was strolling down the street, feeling a little pleased. There was the sound of grating engines and a woman's scream. When I looked around to see what was going on, I saw a car rushing in my direction. I had no notion what was going on until the following second. Mom! Nathan's voice was the first sound I heard in my dazed state of consciousness. I looked over and noticed Nathan staring at me through weeping eyes. My spouse was standing next to me, staring at me with a similar look on his face. 
I couldn't recall the last time I had examined Nathan's face in such detail. Nathan looked a lot like my husband now, but he used to be so small. I'm going to see a doctor while I'm thinking about that. After saying that, my spouse walked out. I was in a hospital, yes. I had the impression that I was lying on a bed in a quiet room, experiencing physical discomfort and seeing the tubes that were connected to me. I knew right away that I had had an accident, but at first I had a hard time believing what the doctor, who later followed my husband to the room, told me. A vehicle operated by an intoxicated driver lost control, struck me, and disregarded the pedestrian green light. While crossing there, six people, including myself, were seriously hurt. Some of them even lost their lives. Despite having suffered severe injuries during my journey to the hospital, I miraculously lived and woke up the following day. I also learned that I would never be able to walk again because of the accident's aftereffects. It was unbelievable to me that my legs, which up until yesterday had moved correctly and instinctively, would suddenly stop working. I immediately found it hard to believe. They will move eventually, I'm sure of it. They had been going along regularly up until this point, so I had such an unrealistic hope. However, despite my belief that I was exerting my typical vigor, my legs seemed non-existent and motionless. Not even could I sense them. Even though my legs, which I could move with ease every day, were still there, they appeared to be missing. That you survived was truly miraculous. We'll try our hardest to assist you with your wheelchair and recovery. Let's work together on this. According to the doctors and nurses, my son and my husband are looking at each other bewildered. I could not be weak in front of my family, as if they were at a loss for words. I should give thanks to the stars for my continued survival. All I could do was appear to be happy and act it out. During my hospital stay, I had to start wheelchair rehabilitation when my wounds and other injuries healed, and I felt better. I had never used a wheelchair before, so I didn't realize how tough it would be. Because I had to use muscles in my arms and back that I had never used before, I was always experiencing upper body muscle aches. Because my upper body was moving and doing so at my own discretion, I put a lot of effort into my recovery, thinking that all I could do was make the most of what I now had because of my own efforts. It was earlier than I had anticipated that I could leave the hospital. For the first time in almost six months, I went back home. I was on free passage when I last left this place. I made an effort to be upbeat, but these kinds of ideas would not go away. I can't even begin to count how many times I felt like this if only I hadn't gone shopping at that moment. My spouse informed me that the incident had destroyed the rice crackers, ice cream, and detergent I had bought at the time. I considered buying them again as soon as I heard it. Part of me wanted to get back to my normal life so I went to the local pharmacy. As anticipated, I was terrified to go to the location of the accident, so I tried to travel to a different pharmacy, but I was unable to do so. The reason for this was the staircase along the path leading to the pharmacy. I had frequented the stairs, so I knew they existed, but I hadn't given it much attention. I was forced to give up and went home to attempt chores, which I also appallingly failed at. Although I never considered them to be steps, I was unable to navigate them on my own in my wheelchair. I was unable to reach the clothes line, which prevented me from handing the washing to dry. The faucet was too far away for me to squat down and utilize for cooking. I was unable to clean the toilet or the bathtub. I thought I was ready for my new life while I was in the hospital getting rehab for a wheelchair. I thought it would be easy to find a way back to my previous life even if I couldn't use my legs. However, I came to the realization for the first time that I would never be able to go back to my previous existence in this body, even if I were to return home. That was really discouraging and frustrating. I made an effort to tiddy my room every day since I didn't want to quit up. I could clean shelves and tables, but not areas that were out of my reach. I should be able to cook if I connect the hose to the faucet. About six months have passed since my return home. I tried my hardest to take advantage of the circumstances. On the other hand, one evening I had been preparing supper since midday for my spouse and Nathan, 
who were scheduled to return home at 7 o'clock p.m. I'd wanted to take my time cooking them a home-cooked lunch because it was our wedding anniversary. I was setting the table with my husband's favorite beef stew that I had managed to make. However, I lost my equilibrium when the wheelchair's tire became tangled in a lettuce core that I had dropped earlier. I flipped the pot of beef stew I was holding onto the ground, but I was able to regain my balance and not fall. In a hurry, I started hosing water onto the dishcloth. However, I let go of the hose, causing it to spiral out of control. The walls and floor of the kitchen were drenched in water. I put myself in the worst possible scenario on such a significant day. But in the past, I've messed up a lot when cooking. My spouse would always return home and quietly tidy up the mess. I was so sad that tears were streaming down my cheeks. My spouse then returned home. When he observed what was happening, he froze. Usually, I would apologize to my husband behind his back, and he would clean up the mess without saying anything. Additionally, my spouse would constantly reassure me that everything was fine, but today was not like that. He let out a deep sigh. I merely mentioned that, and you really don't need to do anything else going forward. His tone of speaking and his demeanor told me. Not much that I can do by myself. Since you two take care of everything for me, I thought I could at least contribute, even if it was simply by cooking. Additionally, in addition, I was going to mention that it was our wedding anniversary, but if you want to be helpful, it's best to do nothing. That was said by my spouse in an irritated manner. The applause that had been building up abruptly subsided. I was powerless to help Nathan or my spouse. All I accomplish with anything I try is obstruct. I have no choice but to do nothing and avoid conflict as much as possible. I have to spend the rest of my life doing that. As my spouse was preparing to bend over and mop the kitchen floor, Nathan entered the room from his return from club activities. Whoa, what just happened? Nathan was requested to fetch a bucket from the restroom by my spouse. Really? After all the running I did during soccer practice, I'm worn out. Do we have to tiddy up once more? All I could do was disturb my family when I got home from work or club activities. I doubted my eligibility to be alive. I started living my life as little as possible, just as my husband had instructed. My spouse packed meals for us the next day so as not to bother them, but someone came home early to make them. While I still spoke with Nathan, I no longer spoke to my husband by myself very often. Naturally, we also abstained from our nightly drinking habit. Two years after the accident in the summer, I did not feel shocked when my husband presented me with the divorce papers. There was nothing I could give my husband, nothing I had to offer. I couldn't help but feel humiliated. He appeared considerably older than his actual age and apologized, but his face was so exhausted. I had burdened him so much. Ironically, I was reminded of the moment I wrote the marriage papers as I was signing my name on the divorce paperwork. I was ecstatic about the bright future I still had ahead of me. I never would have thought, not even for a second, that this would be the end. The divorce papers would never have been signed by me, and if it weren't for that accident, I would have loved the rest of my life. In this sense, I couldn't help but curse my fate. Nathan will be staying with me. You can get cared for by visiting a facility. I'll cover the cost. I assume my husband had the greatest of intentions. Even though it was expected given the facts, tears were welling up in my eyes. Being parted from my cherished son was difficult. However, I could hardly clean the house properly, so it was nearly impossible for me to raise and support him in the future. There was nothing for me to do. I'll make Nathan happy if I accept. Though I was unable to react immediately, I felt that way. I turned to gaze below. Mom can move in with me. Nathan entered the living room unexpectedly and said as much, even though he was meant to remain in his room. These were remarks that neither my spouse nor I had anticipated. I was certain that Nathan and my husband would become weary of helping and taking care of me. I had no doubt Nathan was sick of it. Nathan, I know how you feel but I assume you're finding this difficult as well. Take some time to consider it. 
it doesn't imply you won't see her again. With that, my spouse attempted to convince him. Nathan, however, adamantly declared that he would never reconsider. That's accurate. It's challenging. I'm worn out from club activities and this year's high school entrance exam. To be really honest, I think it would be inconvenient, but I still find it amazing that mom is still trying in spite of her shifting circumstances. Usually, Nathan didn't say much, but when he did, the tears that had been building up in my eyes started to pour down my cheeks in a torrent. Mom is going through the hardest part. It's not easy enough for me and you, Dad. I wish to resemble my mother. I want to work hard and never give up like my mother does. Hence, my desire to live with my mother. Nathan stated as he met my husband's and mine eyes. You were accurate. I apologize. Although my spouse apologized once more and acknowledged his mistake, the divorce was finalized. I relocated to a new home with Nathan after divorcing my spouse. The house was smaller, but it still had a number of barrier-free features. A care worker comes to assist me with tasks every day. Nathan has been taking good care of me and working hard in his club activities. Nathan has a sports scholarship and will attend high school. He says he wants to work as a physical therapist in the future, helping individuals who have been hurt, like me, heal. Nathan's words to me that day gave me courage, even though I know I still have a long way to go. I'm not worthless. I'm doing the best I can. I will accept my fate and make the most of my miraculously preserved life if it would inspire courage in someone else. And I'll keep leading a happy life.